Wednesday. That's okay. Such is life. Look at this giant ugly box I have over here. <laughs> we're sitting here in our small office in New York City. Today, we're going to be discussing something that one of you asked me to discuss, which is tanking, stalling, slash people who take a lot of time. And this is an interesting topic because I think most people naturally do this pretty much correctly, but there are some corner cases where you should stall, but for the most part, you should play very, very quickly. And the reason, the main reason you should play as reasonably quickly as you can is because you make money, assuming you're a winning player, every time you are dealt in. When you get dealt the cards, if you're a winning player, you make money. Now, sometimes you fold those hands, but on average, you're going to make money and your opponents are going to lose money, assuming you're a winning player. Now, obviously, if, like there's a bunch of winning players at the table and a few really bad players, that could be the case. But for you personally, if you are a good, solid winning player, you want to play, well, you want to be dealt in as many hands as you possibly can. So if let's say Jonathan Little gets to play 45 hands per hour every single time he plays, because he plays quickly in live poker... And you, because you're slow, get to play 30 hands per hour. That means I, at the end of the day, am going to make about one and a half times as much money as you make with the exact same win rate per hand. You may say, but won't I make better decisions if I take longer? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, let's imagine you make decisions that are a little bit better. And let's say it wins you an extra, I don't know, two big blinds per hour, which is actually a lot. So you're going to win an extra two big blinds per hour because of your great decisions. If we still have that those time constraints, if I'm making, let's say, naturally, I don't know, 10 big blinds per 30 hands, and you're making 10 big blinds per 30 hands, plus an extra two because you're making more money because you play better than I do, let's pretend. Well, now you're making 12 big blinds per hour, but I'm getting to play 45 hands per hour, which means I'm making 15 big blinds per hour, right? Obviously, those numbers are rough. Actual results will vary, but it kind of works out to being something like that, where if you play reasonably faster than other comparable players, you're just going to make more money. And at the end of the day, my job is to teach my students to make more money from poker. And for that reason, I want to make sure that you realize that you should be playing quickly in most scenarios. So we're going to talk about a few things today. Um, first things first, what are people in general thinking about whenever they are taking their time? Most recreational players, as far as I know, maybe some of you can tell me here if you're a recreational player, most recreational players are thinking about things like, oh my god, I don't want to risk my whole stack, or oh my goodness, I am afraid to lose my rent money, or I have to figure out if I think this guy's bluffing, let me look at him and see if he's bluffing. And then I'll look at the player for a while and see if they're bluffing. Whereas in reality, they're just like guessing. And I don't think that most recreational players are actually thinking about anything that is relevant. I know that sounds a little bit harsh, but I think it's probably true. In reality, what you should be thinking about is you should be trying to figure out how the hand played out, recreate it in your head, and you should be putting both players on a range to see how your hand compares against your opponent's range at this point in time. And quite often, you're going to find that your decision is usually pretty easy, right? And if your decision is pretty easy because either your opponent bluffs way too often or not nearly often enough, you really don't have much to think about. I mean, there are a lot of spots where you have a lot of money at risk, and a lot of people, a lot of recreational players just think forever. But in reality, it's just like a snap call with your, you know, fourth or fifth nut hand, right? So if it's your, if you have a fourth or fifth nut hand and you know you're not folding it because your opponent's reasonable, like what are you thinking about? What's the point of taking time? Because you know you're going to call, right? And right there, if you waste an extra two or three minutes, that's just two or three minutes you don't get to dealt in more hands in the future, right? And that that is a problem. If you burn two or three minutes every hour, every time you have a big decision, that's an extra hand that you don't get dealt in. And if you make, let's say, a dollar per hand, that's a dollar per hour you're giving away. Eight dollars per day. If you play eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, you know, do some math. $160 a month you're just giving away. Lighting on fire because you want to sit there and try to save face in the cases that you lose. 
Some people try to take time because it makes their plays look better throughout. Sure. You have so many books. You're just a noob. Where should you start? Pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. We have a master of the fundamentals course. Can you turn that light back on, please? We have a Mastering the Fundamentals course. It's completely free. You don't have to buy anything. Just go to pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. I do my best to make it easy for people to learn about poker, learn about me, and, um, well, that's the goal. You all may not realize this, but I'm in this game long term. My job is to help you get good at, your, at, good at poker, not just today and tomorrow, but throughout your entire poker playing career. A lot of poker teachers out there try to sell you one big expensive course and then they forget about you. Sad but true. They are in it for the short run. They're not in it to help you long term. They're in it to give you good information, right? I mean, I don't think they're trying to defraud you or anything, but they are not here to help you long term. And I mean, I've been in the poker coaching industry for, I don't know, what, 15 years at this point. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stick around. I'm not retiring age yet, maybe soon. Actually, not soon. Definitely not soon. Maybe in 20 years or something. But we're here for the long term. And that means I need to help people who are novices, right? So we do things like make the fundamentals course. Oh, Julius. Yeah, Mike Sexton left us the other day. You can get his biography at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash sexton. I'm not, on my, uh, I'm not on the sexton level yet, but we'll be there one day. Mike Sexton was my role model. You have ace, if your opponent has ace-king and you have a small pair, is it correct to go all in because you're winning? Well, how do you know your opponent has ace-king? They turned it up? They turned it up, yeah. But very rarely do your opponent turn, turn their hand face up. The further the hand goes, the more time you should spend to think. You always take extra time when you're on the river. Well, the question is, do you need to take extra time on the river, Tomas, right? Like, say you're on the river with the literal second nuts. You lose to, like, one hand, Right? You don't need to think about it, right? You know you have the second nuts. You know you're calling. You may say, but they could have the nuts. Yeah, but that's one hand out of their, you know, however many. It's 50 that they could have that, that you lose to. So sometimes you should take your time calling in scenarios, and you should take more time as the hand gets more complex, right? But that doesn't mean you should sit there and tank just because there's more money at risk. It doesn't make logical sense if you think about it. Blas Zerja, one of my students. Yeah, he's currently the chip leader in the $10,000 buy-in World Poker Tour tournament. After day 1A, yeah, let's go Blas. Blas has been crushing it. Julius, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. Should you take more time when you're bluffing? Well, do you think your opponents are going to think that you going slowly means you're weak? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. You don't know. I don't know. It depends. I personally, given I'm mostly playing against reasonably competent players, try to take about the same amount of time in all decisions, um, which usually is not a whole lot of time because I know how to play decently well. If you watch me play online, we can make a decision in about half a second, right? And it may not be the best decision, but it's going to be the best or the second best decision the vast majority of the time. And um, that's going to be pretty solid. So we're, I typically take about... Five seconds pre-flop. It's not a lot. Usually about 10 seconds on the flop, then about 15 seconds on the turn in the river in all scenarios. Um, should you play slowly to tilt the other players? A lot of people think that, but that's a disastrous mistake because, first off, you don't know you're going to tilt your opponents. And also, if you play half as many hands per hour as other people, you make half as much money. Let's say you make your opponents tilt hard and you have... 1.5 times the win rate, which you will not. Well, let's presume you have 1.5 times the win rate. You still lose. You still win less money. Should you take your time when your tournament life is at risk? No, because it's either an easy play or it's, if it's an easy play, you should not. Here's a good example. Let's say you have aces all in on the first hand of the tournament. Goes raise, 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 whatever. You have aces. Should you take your time with the aces there? Like, let's say you're closing the action. Let's say you raise aces. It goes three bet, four bet, all in. Or say it goes three bet all in, four bet call, or four bet, five bet, whatever. Everybody's just all in. I'm getting the action wrong. You raise, someone goes all in, someone calls, someone calls, someone calls. We have aces. Our tournament life's at risk. Should we take our time? Like, no! We have the aces. You pile your money in, move on, right? Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It's ridiculous to think that just because 
your tournament life is at risk, that you should all of a sudden start wasting time. Because it actually is wasting time. Um, you may say, what if more money is at risk? Well, if that's the case, if you're like in the middle stage of the tournament, you should be playing way slower than at the beginning of the tournament because you have twice as much money at risk or three times as much money at risk. <sighs> exactly what content did Blas learn from me? We had um, hand history reviews back and forth. They're actually part of Poker Coaching Premium, I believe. They should be. If you go to pokercoaching.com, look in the courses or the classes somewhere, you'll actually see a lot of the back and forth I had with Blas um, getting prepared for the World Series of Poker and, um, and onward. All right, all right, all right. We're going to try to keep the... Con I see all of you asking a bunch of random questions. We're trying to keep this to discussion of stalling, tanking, etc., how long does it take your students to make a living out of playing poker? Depends on where they're starting, clearly, right? Depends on what they're trying to accomplish. Everyone's not trying to become a professional poker player as well. Turns out, though, if you devote your life to poker and you're willing to put in about 12 hours a day every day, as I was as a young person, you can get pretty great at poker pretty fast, especially if you're willing to start small and play a ton. All right. Um, okay, so we know we should not stall to try to tilt people. We know we should not stall to try to induce a bluff or induce a call because who knows what you're actually going to induce. You're not Nostradamus. You don't know what your opponents are thinking. So those are both ridiculous reasons. When should we actually stall? And there are a few times. The main, most obvious time is on the payout bubble, when you're not hand for hand yet. Um, a lot of tournaments are getting wise. They're starting to go hand for hand pretty early. But let's say 104 people, or 100, 115 people remain in the, in the tournament, and 100 people get paid. So we have to lose 15% of the field. And let's presume we are, I don't know, like in 90th place out of 115. So if we play any hand, we're going to be at risk. And we don't want to be at risk. But we know if we just sit here and blind out or don't play very many hands, we are pretty likely to get in the money. Like, really likely to get in the money. So now, should we stall? And the answer is probably yes. The question is, how soon should you begin stalling? And I think, he, I don't know if there's like an exact formula for this, but let's say you are down, let's say you need to lose like another 15-ish percent of the field. It's probably okay to consider stalling at that point. Um, but you don't want to start stalling very early because then you just really crush your chances of actually winning the tournament. There's some point where your equity in just getting a min cash is substantial. That's usually when you are near the bottom of the chip stacks and you are also still kind of likely to get a cash. Now, let's say you're in 112th place out of 115 people with um, six big blinds or seven big blinds or 10 big blinds and 100 get paid, and 115 remain. At that point, you probably just need to be playing and trying to get a double up. Very rarely do you want to stall really hard when you are very likely to be someone who's going to bust just based on like blinding out, right? If blinding out will result in you not getting in the money, you definitely don't want to be stalling. You want to be trying to get a hold of some chips. Um, so sh you should typically be stalling when you're a medium stack that is... Likely going to be at risk if it does have to play a pot, but you're also very likely to be able to just collect a cash. At that point, you'd rather the tournament just stop, the people lower chips than you go broke, and you get in the money, right? And the way you essentially make the tournament stop is by playing very, very slowly. Um, in online tournaments, you can take your whole 30 seconds or 15 seconds, whatever they give you preflop, and then, if necessary, burn some of your time, time bank. Um, I would not burn a ton of time bank on the bubble, though. There'd probably be better spots for this, for burning your time bank, but there certainly are scenarios where that does make sense. So be aware of that. Um, the next most obvious spot is when you're going to be at risk on a payout jump. This could be any payout jump. Let's say, I don't know, 90th place gets $100 and 89th place gets $120. That's the cash, right? If that's the case, when you are down to 90 people, if you're going to be all in... You want to make that hand take as absolutely long as possible. So how do we make this hand take as long as possible? And the, way you, the reason I say you want it to take as long as possible is because if someone at another table goes broke while you're in the middle of this hand, you get 89th place and you get an extra $20. And you'd rather get an extra $20 than not, right? So let's say we're playing a hand. We raise... Let, let, let's take a simple scenario. Let's say someone raises, we have 20 big blinds, and we know we're going to go all in with our ace-king offsuit. Okay. What should we do? Someone raises, we have ace-king offsuit, we know we're going to play the hand. It's an easy all-in. Should we go all-in? Think a second, think about it. We want this hand to take as long as possible. What do we do? Well, we take as long as we can, 
preflop. Make him call the clock on you. <laughs> Annoying, I know. Um, this is if we only care about making money and we don't care about making friends. So first things first, you take as long as they will give you preflop. It's going to be like three or four minutes. A lot can happen in three or four minutes at the other tables. They'll get in two or three hands at the other tables in that time, and someone will go broke sometimes. Next, we have 20 big blinds. Bet 19 of them. Don't go all in. Don't go all in. Bet 19 of them. Okay? Get the back around to the other guy. If he folds, great. Move on with your life. If he goes all in for one big blind more, <laughs> make him call the clock on you again. They'll call the clock on you way faster this time. Now, look, I have never actually done this to the point that it's been egregious. I've never had the clock called on me in my entire life. But there certainly are times where you should stall. And if you are good at reading the table, you'll know what they view as acceptable. And most good pros are going to realize that this is a spot where you're kind of like entitled to stall. Entitled. You're entitled to stall for a bit because this is the optimal play. You'd be burning money to not stall. And they understand that. They accept that. And if you are a big stack in this scenario and you want the game to go quickly, clock them. I've called the clock on a bunch of people on the bubble. Like a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of people on the bubble. And I have it's, it's their absolute um, right to take as much time as they want preflop. And it's my absolute right to call the clock on them as the big stack. And you should not feel the least bit bad about that. As the player is a better player, a more respected player, clock them even harder because they know what they're doing and they know that you have, you're well within the rules to call the clock on them if they are stalling in this in this manner. So don't, it's like, it's nothing personal. Some people will act like it's personal. Some people will get offended. But realize, as, as the big stack, you make money whenever you play hands, right? Especially on the bubble because you're going to have a big edge on the bubble or at payout jumps and you want the game to move. Okay. Ryan just took down six, the $6,000 guaranteed 20 minutes ago. Wow, nice. Congrats. All right, so that's a time where on the bubble as a short stack or when you're going to be all in, you definitely want to take your time, right? So if you know you're going to be at risk on a payout jump, you should always take your time. If you're playing online, you should burn your whole time bank because in this scenario, let's say we do get it all in, or let's, let's say we raise with ace-king and someone goes all in and we know we're going to call her all in. You should take your whole time bank or until you get the payout jump before calling because you know you're going to be all in here. So you know, let's say the pot's going to be worth, I don't know, $100. Would you rather get it all in for $100 or would you rather get it all in for $120? Like obviously you'd rather get it in for $120 because you're going to get half of that equity roughly. So instead of getting $50, or $50 out of the pot, you know, 50% of $100, you get 50% out of $120. Of 120. Obviously, you'd rather get 50% of 120 than of 100. So you should be very, very willing to use a lot of your time bank in that scenario. I have a recommendation for someone who plays $10 No Limit. The Cash Game Masterclass at PokerCoaching.com. Go to PokerCoaching.com slash premium, sign up, go through the Cash Game Masterclass, and you'll be well-equipped to beat small stakes online with relatively few issues. All right. Um, when should you also stall? All right, another time. You should definitely stall. Near the end of the day or near when your table is going to break. This is often very clear in, well, you're, you know when your table is going to break live very frequently because they'll just like break straight down the row. So like say they have 100 tables that break table 100, then 99, then 98, then 97. So if you're sitting there at table 96 and they break table 97, you should be paying attention. You should know roughly how long it takes for each table to break. So let's say we know it took 10 minutes for each table to break. Okay, so far we've been paying attention. We know it's coming. It's obvious, right? It's the banging around chip racks over here. You know what's happening. It takes 10 minutes roughly for a table to break. Okay, fine. When you get down to like three or four or five minutes remaining, and it's gonna be rough sometimes, you may get this wrong, but you want to try to make a point that you end up being under the gun, under the gun plus one, under the gun plus two when the table breaks because that results in you paying fewer blinds. It's going to result in you playing like one or one and a half big blinds less than the other people. And that is very, very valuable. Now, you don't want to just sit there and stall the entire 10 minutes because then you may end up just paying the blind and it doesn't do any good, right? So let's say you are in the big blind whenever you know you have like a 10 minute clock going. You know you're going to have to play through this whole orbit pretty much. So you want to play really fast. You want to pay the blind and you want to pay the blind again 
and then you want to end up you're going to end up in like the hijack or the low jack seat your job is to try to get in i guess maybe that's like 10 minutes is a little bit short if you have 10 minutes maybe you actually should just stall the whole time because i don't know if you can get in 15 hands in 10 minutes so you probably can't let's say you did have 15 minutes though i would go for the play fast routine um obviously if your opponents are competent they're going to try to thwart this but they won't a lot of people just don't care um let's say we know we have seven minutes and we're, we just paid the big blind once you start getting to like low jack seat you should be playing pretty slow because you really don't want to pay the blinds and you know that they're going to break a table soon right so essentially you want to make sure you don't pay the big blind again or if you know you're going to have to play the pay the big blind again you want to make sure you play almost the entire full orbit after you pay the big blind okay um towards the end of the day Towards the end of the day, very often, what they will do in live poker is they will play until like 10 minutes before the end of the day. Usually, this casinos do the same every time. So let's say the day ends at midnight, they'll stop at 11.50, and they'll draw for the number of hands they're going to play to try to make it fair. Fair. In reality, what ends up happening is they will usually pick between three, four, and five hands, or something like that, or four, or five, and six hands. So you know that in this scenario, you want to end up when they draw for hands, in roughly the button, something like that. You want to be on roughly the button, maybe the small blind, maybe the cutoff, depending on how many hands they draw, because that's going to result in you not playing the blinds again. You really don't want to be under the gun plus one or two or three, because you know you're going to have to pay the blinds again, right? So you want to take your time in specific scenarios to try to land in the cutoff or hijack seat, depending on how many hands they draw at your casino on average, to make sure you don't end up paying the big blind again. And very often near the end of the days in poker tournaments, the big blind is quite valuable, right? And you may say, like, do we really care about a big blind? And the answer is yes, you do. Because a big blind there may be worth $100 or $500 or $1,000, right? It's very, 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 very valuable. So you want to make sure that you don't end up paying that. Um, so those are really the main times you should go slowly. You'll see that it doesn't happen all that often. So the main times you should even consider stalling are on the bubble, when there's a payout jump, and when your table's gonna break. Oh, online, online, online. Online, what a lot of places do, is they'll just say the day ends at midnight, and the tournament will literally stop at midnight. There's no five hand random draw type thing. It is purely midnight, we're done. I know I was playing a tournament the other day, it ended at midnight, and um, I, I timed it great and didn't pay the blinds, right? And like at that point, I think the big blind was, I did the math, the big blind was worth something like 500 bucks. So by stalling appropriately, I did not pay $500. Could you imagine how valuable that is? It's just like I literally made $500 because I'm aware of this concept. And this happens frequently. So this is a situation where um, you want to pay attention. If they end straight at midnight, you sure better end up under the gun, under the gun plus one or under the gun plus two at midnight. Otherwise, you screwed up. And... Like I said, if your opponents are good and competent, they're going to figure this out and not let you because they're just going to stall hard too. They'll be willing to burn their time banks as well. Um, but be aware of it, right? If you use your time bank a lot, isn't there a risk that people will be annoyed and try to bust you? Well, Harmony, let's presume your opponents are going to all of a sudden start playing really poorly against you. Is that bad? Is that actually bad? No, it's good. You want your opponents playing poorly against you. And you may say, also, if you use your time bank a lot, if you use your time bank a lot, you're going to run out of time. Like, if you're playing online, everyone is entitled to use their time bank as they see fit, right? And also, if you, people who ask this question, by the way, they often get annoyed when someone goes slow. Realize that if you're getting annoyed because someone is using their time bank within the rules of the game, Think about how asinine that thought process is. Someone's playing by the rules. I'm mad. That's what you're saying. They're playing by the rules, but you don't like their rules. You don't like the rules of the game that you signed up for. So understand that. Please understand that if someone is playing within the rules, you should not be mad at them. You should be mad at the rules. Right? Which is why, like I said earlier, when I'm the big stack on the bubble, I'm clocking people left and right. And live poker... Because I'm allowed to. That's the rules, right? They're allowed to try to go slow. I'm allowed to call the clock. And that's A-OK. -okay. And if you are, I don't know, not aware of the rules, if you're not willing to play within the rules, I mean, then that, that's your problem, right?
when you're at a final table, should you stall? No, you should not stall at a final table. That makes literally no sense. Now, okay, here's another reason to stall I didn't exactly um, mention. But if you're bad at poker, so far, I, this is all assumed that you are a winning player. If you're a losing player, if you're a losing player, you actually want to play as few hands as possible because every hand that you're dealt in, you lose. So if you're at a final table and you know you're clearly outmatched, I mean, from a game theory point of view, you should play as slowly as you possibly can because in theory, you would rather everybody have one big blind left and you just have to go all in or fold, right? You want an all in or fold game. And... How do you do that? How do you accomplish that? Well, you take forever. You go as slowly as you possibly can, and you let the blinds get gigantic. Is that fun? Is that exciting? No. And interestingly enough, someone pointed this out earlier, a lot of recreational players love a good, fast, fun-moving game. And it's true, but they shouldn't. Recreational players who are losing, again, rec someone asked earlier as well, can a recreational player be a winning player? Sure, just play with people who are worse than you, right? All you have to do to win at poker, it's really easy. No one likes to think it's this easy, but it actually is this easy. Find a game you can beat, find people who are worse than you who will play with you, and then play with them a lot. Easy game. Now, you may not be able to play super high stakes, because then only better people than you will want to play with you, but all you have to do is find worse people than you and play with them a ton. I mean, this is how a lot of like these Hollywood home games happen, where you have all of these celebrities going to play against people who couldn't beat 5 to no limit at Bellagio, because I play with them and they, they lose, yet they're sitting here getting to play 200-400 with celebrities. They did a great job at marketing, a great job at uh, finding a game they can beat and playing it, right? And that that is perhaps part of the game, depending if that's how you want to play it. You may say, that, is that against the rules? Eh, I don't know. Apparently not. <laughs> um, look. The world is governed by rules slash frameworks. And if you don't like them, you can either change them or deal with them, right? And if you don't like the fact that online people have a three-minute time bank or a five-minute time bank that they can use as they see fit, realize you are incentivized to use your time bank as you see fit. And if you don't use it as you see fit, you are leaving money on the table. What about going faster so the small stacks are pressured to play the blinds? So, Diane, funny enough, I actually had this written down, and I scratched it out because I, I don't even think it's worth mentioning because the value you get out of that is minimal, and you would much, much, much rather conserve your chips, or I'm sorry, your time bank for the times that are really beneficial to you, which are going to be specifically when you are at risk in payout jump scenarios because you don't have infinite time bank. You really don't. So... Given you don't have infinite time bank, you have to use it intelligently. What you're referring to essentially, though, is um, like let's say I know the blinds are going to go up in 20 seconds. Should I stall 20 seconds so a 15 big blind stack becomes a 10 big blind stack when they hit the big blind? And like you can, yeah, it sucks for them, but realize it also sucks for you because it's not like like you want to play as deep stacked as you can within reason. How do players get others to buy stacks, buy stakes in them? You have to prove that you are a profitable player. People aren't just going to buy action in people. Also, you should not strive to have people buy action in you, by the way. There's somehow become this weird staking economy where everyone thinks that like making it means you get staked. Making it is getting to the point that you can fully buy yourself in so that you keep all of your profits instead of only some of them. And you have so much money that you can go buy pieces of other people. I mean, I'm out there buying pieces of people all the time because I can't invest as much of my bankroll each opportunity as I'd like. So I'm in there firing it in as fast as I can, feeding the machine, you know? And that's where you want to be. You don't want to be the person who is not able to play unless someone helps you out. Learn to fend for yourself. Goodness gracious. Come on, everyone. You have to learn to fend for yourself. Making it is not taking handouts or anything like that. Making it is providing for yourself based on your superior skills. Is there an optimal limping strategy? Sure. How often would you say the chip leader wins at a final table? Depends on how big the chip leader is. If the chip leader has 95% of the chips, most of the time. The chip leader has none of the chips, well, you know, 11% of the chips, probably not all that often. It's not a, not a great question. How far can you get with the cash game masterclass? High stakes? 
I know a few people who are winning at 1025 No Limit. They have these 1025 No Limit games in um, California, and I have a few people who were playing 1-2 just like last year. Now they're playing 1025, making 200 bucks an hour. So how high can you make it? I mean, it depends on how like high you want, how hard you want to work. And again, we talked about this earlier. I'm not making one course and trying to sell it to you and then forget about you. Poker is a game where you have to consistently learn. It's an ongoing process. It's not as easy as watch this thing or take this course and then never study again, right? That's not what poker is. I hate to break it to you. I know all these people are trying to sell you a course for $1,500 and then they forget about you. That's not what I do here. That's not how we help you long-term and make you actually successful. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, anyway, moving forward. Um, so we've talked about tanking a lot here, stalling, etc. When you have a difficult decision, you should be taking your time, but you should not be taking time for no real reason. Because when you take time for no real reason, or when you just go slowly, because that's what you think you're supposed to do, you end up playing fewer hands per hour than everyone else. Right, And if you play fewer hands than everyone else, what inevitably happens is you are dealt in fewer hands and then you make less money than everyone else. If you look at most of the best players in the world, not all, but most, they play pretty fast, like faster than you would think. And that's because they realize there's no point in wasting time. Preflop, right? Whenever it's your turn, preflop, if you know you're folding, there is no point in taking time. Now, Go back to another reason you may want to take a second. Let's say preflop. It gets to you. You're in the cutoff. You have the 7-3 suited. You know you're going to fold. If you look at your cards and you act like you're going to play, if you're against very bad players, like who are oblivious, very often, if you look to the left, you'll see the player in the small blind or the player in the big blind look at their cards and they'll be like, oh, okay, my hand's not good. I'm going to fold. And they'll tell you they're going to fold while it's still your turn in the cutoff. So now, if you can look and tell the button's going to fold and the small blind's going to fold, now it's as if... You and the cutoff are now on the button against one big blind with a dead small blind in the pot. Now that 7-3 suit, it becomes reasonable, right? But that's only going to be the case against like really oblivious players. And there still are some oblivious players out there, especially in you know, small stakes live games. Online, this concept is completely ridiculous because you can't look to the left in online poker and see what they're going to do. But that's another case where taking a little bit of time is relevant. I remember talking to one player once where he said on the river, he will just basically always take as long as he can because eventually his opponents will crack if he stares at him long enough. Maybe true, maybe not. Um, I, I, don't, I think it certainly could be true. So I don't know. It's tough to say. It's tough to say if that's true. I have not really experimented with taking 10 minutes on every river because... Um, guess I'm not that good at reading people to the point that I can look and tell definitively if they have it or not. But I mean, I guess if you somehow correlated that, that's fine. But uh, who knows? Why would a player that is not a pro play themselves instead of just buying pieces of people who are a real pro? Because when you buy people pieces of people who are a real pro, you have to pay markup. And markup takes away all your profits. That said, if you're bad at poker, yeah, you should probably be buying action people instead of... Um, playing yourself. Like, say you know every time you play, you're going to lose 20%, or you can buy action in someone you know you're going to break even. You'd rather break even than lose 20%, clearly. Why would you play slot machines when you could play roulette? I don't know. Why would you play roulette when you could play blackjack? I don't know. People do it, though. Walk through the casino. They pay, play the most negative EV things. Figure that one out. Is Garrett Adelstein good at poker? Yes, Garrett, Ad Garrett Adelstein is a absolute sicko. I've had the pleasure of playing with him a few times, and... Um, he will make you fearful. Not a whole lot of people make you fearful at the poker table. Like he makes everyone fearful. If, to be fair, once you realize what you have to do to beat him, it's not like it's um, incredibly difficult. You just realize you're going to have infinite variance. So if you don't want infinite variance, keep a relatively shallow stack and don't fold, right? I mean, so th those who don't know Garrett, Garrett will make gigantic bets. He is known for just like, you know, 10x pot over bets on the river and whatnot. And it turns out everybody folds to him. Except for me. <laughs> you just have to call, right? Just call a lot. And um, if you don't want to be doing that for giant stakes, then just buy in for like 100 big lines, right? What a lot of people do is they make this blunder of just thinking, all right, I need to have everybody at the table covered. 
So then they'll all go to play 10, 20, no limit, and they'll be sitting there with $20,000 in front of them. Well, it turns out when the player wants you to risk $20,000 into a $1,500 pot, you probably don't call all that often, right? And that, that results in Garrett running these players over. So if you don't want to be in that scenario, you want to make your life way easier, you want to take away one of those skills that Garrett is probably close to the best in the world at, don't let him play that game. Turns out if you take away your opponent's best skills, puts him, puts him in a much more difficult spot. Railstar, I literally just answered your question. How many hours is Optum for private coaching session? At a time? I don't know. Like one hour at a time? I don't, I'm not sure. Why would a pro ask for someone to stake them? This makes logic. There, there are many reasons why this may be the case. Um, number one is to minimize variance, right? Like I sell action in $10,000 tournaments, even though I'm bankrolled for them. Why would I do that? Because I would rather not have, not experience the full brunt of variance, right? And you get to sell it in markup, right? So if you could get to sell it a bit of a markup, you get to lower your average buy-in, which is generally good for your bankroll. It means you have to have less cash on hand. And also you um, you get to just like you get to make more money out the door sometimes, depending on the way you go about selling the action. Um, also, it may help you get money to and from places, which is sometimes difficult. I mean, there are reasons to sell action, it's, but the main time is when you're playing at the upper end of your average buy-in. Like, if I'm playing 25Ks, I'll usually sell action. Because I'm not bankrolled for 25Ks. I don't have $7.5 million in the bank yet. Maybe one day, but not yet. And therefore, I need to sell action if I want to play those, but I'm still probably profitable in them, right? But for the most part, if you're playing small and medium stakes games, you don't need to sell action because you can just move up to the higher stake, right? And if you are profitable in a higher stake, but you have plenty of time to play in the lower stake, like plenty of action, plenty of opportunities, you don't need to play the higher stakes games, right? When you're playing the very higher, very high stakes games, there aren't, there's not enough volume to go around. That's a big problem. So in order to get volume, you either need to sell action or bigger in bigger tournaments or not play, right? Because like, let's say you go to a tournament series and they have one 5K main event and a 10K side event and a 25K side event and then a bunch of $1,000 tournaments. The $1,000 tournaments may not be worth your time because you're bankroll for 10Ks. And um, you just don't have many other opportunities to get in volume. So you want to figure out ways to get in volume. There are certainly times for that, though. <sighs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. You're running at 5 EV1 per 100 over 50K hands, but still showing a loss. Could you explain why this is? You may be bad with shallow stacks. You may be uh, playing a big spread of tournaments where you're losing hard in the high stakes and crushing the low stakes. You may just be experiencing variance because 50K hands isn't all that much. Um, in general, if you're, you have like between 6 and 8 EV Big Blind per 100, you're probably playing in the right games. I don't know what spread you're playing, Adam, but say you're playing $10 tournaments up to $50 tournaments, cut out the $50 tournaments, play like 10 to 30, and you're going to see that EV Big Blind per 100 increase, certainly. Has James or Thomas appeared? Not today. Thomas is sleeping today. Thomas woke up at 4 a.m. today, which is not ideal. Are there players I don't like to play against? There are certainly people who are... Not fun to play with. Can you please enter Survivor? I have applied for Survivor. I think I have as about as an unfair advantage as I could possibly ask for with uh, two previous champions vouching for me, talking to the uh, producers. But um, that still may not be enough. Mark says, been playing the free quizzes on poker coaching and you're already improving your game. Good. Glad to hear it. All right. That's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Essentially, play fast, play quickly, learn to play well. Learn to play well. That is the secret to playing quickly. People always ask, how can you play 20 tables at a time? The answer is, you know how to play the vast majority of scenarios. So, learn to play well. How do you learn to play well? Study at PokerCoaching.com. If you're new to the game and you don't even, like, if you go to poker coaching and stuff, just way over your head. I made a course for you called Master the Fundamentals. It won't take you too long to get through. And that will make sure you are up to speed. Did I bink the book vote? We did. Excelling at No Limit Hold'em is currently in the top four. I believe there will be another vote on Friday. So if you go to jonathanlillipoker.com slash vote on Friday, I would appreciate it. Excelling at No Limit Hold'em is in the top four of the greatest poker books of all time, which is not, not an accurate uh, name because my best book, Mastering Small Stakes and No Limit Hold'em, wasn't even in it. 
which is a bummer. But, you know, that's how it goes. Whenever someone arbitrarily picks 64 books, they won't necessarily pick the best one. It's funny because, like, I've read almost every poker book. <laughs> I think of the 64 in the, uh, in the bracket, I'd read 60 of them. And the other four were, like, kind of obscure. And I, I, I mean, look, my job as a writer and as an educator is to understand the whole market, right? And therefore, I do a lot of research. And um, I'm pretty sure Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em is the best poker book, at least from an educational point of view. Um, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em is great too, though, because it's a collection of content by a lot of the best players in the world. And actually, uh, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em was so great, we made number two. It's actually not number two, because it turns out if you put number two in a book title, it does really poorly. So this is not Excelling 2. This is Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em. I got many of the absolute best poker players in the world to make content for. We have Draft Ganger, Burt Stevens, the crusher. He was number one in the world at one point online just a year or two ago before he decided to chill and love life a little bit more. Um, he's a poker coaching coach now. He's been streaming for us. Check out his content. It's available free. It's available as part of poker coaching. Um, also, we have Ape Styles, John Van Fleet. I love his content. I hope we get to work with him more in the future. He, uh, he's been absolutely crushing it. We have Rob Tenyon. He's won the Sunday Million twice. We have Vlada, I don't know how to say his last name, Stojanovic. Vlada Stojanovic, he won the $10,000 buy-in Poker Stars uh, Stadium Series last month for about a million and a half dollars. So good job to him. Anyway, lots and lots of good content here. This is a good book. This, this might be Jonathan Little's favorite poker book for Jonathan Little for high-level poker players. This is probably not for, this is not for beginners. I can, I can go ahead and tell you, this is not for beginners. This is for poker players who are already pretty good, who know what they're doing, who want to learn from the absolute best players in the world. So anyway, this just came out the other day. You can, um, where can you get this? I don't even know. I don't have a link yet. Go to dnbpoker.com. D-A-N-D-B-Poker.com. And it should be available for you there. I think it's the only place you can get it right now. Although, ebook will be available soon. What's the link to vote again? jonathanlittlepoker.com slash vote but it's not available right now because we already made it through and I think you cannot vote again for me until Friday but I'll post it on Twitter and I would appreciate you voting for it you just started Modern Poker Theory and you're a bit lost Modern Poker Theory is a hard book it's, a, it's, it's another very tough book that actually would have been my vote for the best book for Jonathan Little pre this book funny enough my job now at DMB Poker in addition to writing books is to cultivate content. So what's the poker world missing? Well, before Modern Poker Theory in this book, it was missing really high-level content. And these are these are really high-level books. I mean, look, it's just like full of full of pile charts and whatnot, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a chapter here by uh, by Vlada on ICM. Like I thought I kind of understood ICM. I figured I was pretty good at it. Turns out. Vlad is a master at ICM. I learned a lot from that chapter. So anyway, that's going to be it for today. Um, enjoy yourselves. Make the most of it. Don't stall. Go quick. The more hands you play, the more money you make. Turns out, that's all you have to do. Find people you can play against and play against them a lot. And it turns out if you play one and a half times as much as your opponents, you'll make more money. One and a half times as much. If you want that book, Mastering Small Stakes, no limit, hold them. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash mastering, and you can that's a link to it. Give us some ICM secrets. As the big stack, you get to bluff a lot post-flop. I was kind of unaware of it. Um, there's an example where, let's say, medium stack raises. You're on the big blind, and you call. Anytime the flop comes low cards, like low connected cards that are good for your range, very often you should be betting small on the flop, blasting turn, jamming river for like 40 big blind stacks, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. When the board comes like... Seven six three, right? Where you have a lot of nut hands and the other player doesn't. On the bubble, if there's shallow stack, or on the uh, at the final table when there's shallow stacks around, you should just be blasting the middle stacks because every hand in their range is a bluff catcher, and you can't call off with bluff catchers when there are a bunch of shallow stacks around due to the immense risk premium. Like you can tell your opponent, you can say, "Hello, you have the best hand sixty five percent of the time," and if they understand ICM, they can't call, which is sick. <laughs> so anyway. Excelling at Tough No Limit Holding Games. Fun spot. He goes through and shows a, a lot of spots with uh, Monker Solver discussing how ICM applies, and it's, it's good. It's good stuff. Lots of good stuff. 
Yeah, ICM secret. If there was an easy soundbite, everybody would, do, would be doing it right. Yeah. I'm really good at preflop ICM, but as stacks in some terms get deeper and deeper and deeper, a lot of this postflop stuff is just completely unexplored because there was no program to do it, really, prior to, to Monker Solver. And now that you can plug in all these spots, I mean, it still takes you know hundreds of dollars to run a simulation. <laughs> but uh, well, if, you, if you're willing to spend the money and find it, find the solutions, then uh, you'll, you'll just crush your opponents. Assuming they know what they're doing, which maybe they do, maybe they don't. A lot of you are asking me a bunch of random questions. I don't even know what words you're saying. Anyway, that's that. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most of it. You only have one life. Live it to the most. Live it to the best. Live it to the best of your ability. All right. See you later.